Once again, good morning. It's a joy to gather and uh, worship our great God and King together. Uh, It's a privilege to stand here this morning to share God's word with you. I, I, I now pray that we will behold our great God and King, Jesus Christ, through the preaching of, of his word. Um, so for today, I would like to please ask you all to kindly take your Bibles and let us turn to the book of First John. First John, we're taking a break on our Matthew uh, 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 study. So let us turn our Bibles to First John chapter 4. And we are going to read from verses 7 to 11. Um, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 11. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that this is a, a verse that we are uh, uh, familiar to. Um, perhaps some, some of you have preached it before or taught it before. Um, so please, I, I trust the Lord that we have found it. So let us, let us uh, read together. First John chapter 4, verse 7 to 11. This is what the word of God says. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Verse 11. Beloved, If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Amen? Let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Our great God and and King, Father, we are so grateful that we have an opportunity to hold your word in our hands. And now, Lord, as we seek to faithfully, Lord, teach it, preach it, May you, Lord, please help me um, to boldly and faithfully proclaim. If I know I'm just a mere man, um, weak, but let your word speak, O oh, Father. I pray even for my friends as they listen. May you, Lord, please just help them to see your love, to see Christ um, in the message of today. May you, Lord, please help me. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. So today I would like to talk to you this morning about a subject that is very familiar to us, a subject that we all like, and that's the subject of love. Okay, this is what I want us to learn today and and, and, uh, talk about as we come to the preaching of his word. So the theme for today's message is simply, very simple, uh, let us love one another. Let us love one another. Why do you love your wife if you are married? Why do you love your husband? Um, or why do you love your parents or your children? Or, or, or why do you love anyone that you come into contact with? Um, take some time and just answer this question, right? Why, why do you love them? Well, so, some of us might have very good answers to this uh, to these questions, right? Um, some, some will say, well, I, I, I love them because they respect me. I, I love them because they provide for, for, for me. Well, I, I love them because they look like me, right? Um, or they buy f- clothes for me, right? So it's really for kids, right? I love my parents because they, they buy food for me. Um, or for the married one, we say, I, I love my wife because she's a good wife. Um, she's the mother of my, of my children, uh, or the, the husband might say that I, I, I love my, or the wife might say I love my husband because he provides for me. He's so loving. Um, 
But one of the most common answers to this, to this question is, well, I love them because they love me. Right? Um, we live in the world that is teaching us we should love the lovable, isn't it? So some of us might not even know what to, what to say to, to, this, to these questions. And, and, and friends, what we see common to these good answers is the self-centeredness of this love. Well, the love that we see that the world offers, we shouldn't surprise or we shouldn't be surprised about it. It's, it's to be expected of a broken world. And the church today, we desperately need to answer this question as well, right? And, and sadly, we have people in the church or Christians that will say, well, I decide who to love, right? You, you, you can't tell me who or how to love. Uh, 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 or, or perhaps some, some will say, brother, uh, loving is not, is not easy. And, and it's true. I, 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 I sympathize with you. Um, I, I am with you. And, and some might say, we live in a different era, right? We live in a different era uh, with many difficult... It's not easy. Brother, you, you just don't understand. There's a lot of fake Christians, you know, hypocritical Christians and, and things like that. I, I once again sympathize with you. That's, that's true. And you're not in that struggle alone. You are not in that, in that struggle alone. We, we, we are saved by God's grace, right? And, and by his grace, we are added into the church, the body of Christ, right? Christ, the incarnate word of God, the Bible, Christ's word, is the authority for our church, right? So, my friends, the struggles to love is real. But a Christian to willfully be unloving is not an option, right? A lack of love should not be a mark of a Christian community. That's, that's something that we, we, should, we should really understand. And today I just want us to see the importance of this subject from our text. Okay? I want us all to see the importance of this uh, subject uh, in our text. Because God commands us to love one another. Therefore, loving one another should be a Christian's lifestyle. Right? God commands us to love one another. Therefore, loving one another should be a Christian's lifestyle. And, and not only that, but a church should be a display of the love of God. Right? Now, before we, we, we study this text together, let's just uh, have some few contexts that will help us understand what uh, Apostle John is, is writing here. For we need to understand that the audience to which the Apostle John is writing to uh, they are facing a very delicate situation. One, uh, false teachers have crept into the church. Uh, they are teaching a different Christ, right? Uh, they are denying the humanity of Christ. Um, that's why when you open the, the, the letter of 1 John, let's just quickly go there together. 1 John chapter 1, this is what uh, the Apostle John says. Uh, let's, let's be good Bereans and let's open our Bible. So let's Go to um, chapter 1, and we are going to uh, read a lot of uh, uh, verses in, in, in the same book. This is what he says, um, verse 1 and, and 2. He says this, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have uh, seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. We can clearly see from here that the Apostle John is saying that Christ was man. We, we have seen him, we have touched him. So these false teachers who are coming to deny the, the humanity of Christ, the Apostle John, from the get-go, makes it clear that the church understands that that's not true. Not only that, but this false teacher that have crept in has influenced also some members, right? And as a result, uh, in, in chapter 2 of the same book, verse 19, the Apostle John says, They went out from us, 
but they were not of us. For if they, were, if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it may become plain that they are, they are all, that they all are not of us. So it's in the context of all this that is happening in this, in this uh, 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 community that the apostle John comes and, and, and reassures them of the love of God, right? He, he, him being inspired by the Holy Spirit, he points to them that God is love, and in the midst of what's happening in their context, they should love one another, right? Um, in other words, they should also understand the implication of the love of God. And it's very evident that Apostle John loved, loved this church. Like, he, he loved them. You, you can clearly see from, from, from words like, my little children, beloved children. You know, he, he constantly says that. Like, chapter 2, verse 2, he says, my little children. Um, chapter 2, 7, he says, beloved. Chapter 2, verse 18, he said, children. Chapter 2, verse 28, he says again, little children. Chapter 3, verse 7 is, again, little children. And the chapter where we are now, verse 1, he also says, beloved. And verse 7, beloved. Verse 11, beloved. He, 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 you, can, you can clearly see that affection, right? He loved this, this little uh, uh, church. Not only that, but it also believed in church history that before Apostle John died, his last words were, little children, love one another. And brothers, this message is for us today as well. This message is for us today. As you are seated there, you might ask yourself then, why? Doesn't, doesn't Apostle John understand the struggles that we have to love? Right? Why is this so important? Why are we as a church saying that we should love one another? And from our text, we are going to answer this question together. So let us uh, uh, study together. I would like to answer this pertinent question uh, by highlighting just three reasons, okay? So three reasons, three reasons as to why we are called or commanded to love one another. And the first reason is we should love one another because God is the source of love. Right? God is the source of love. The second reason is we should love one another because love is a mark of genuine Christianity. We should love one another because uh, uh, love is a mark of genuine Christianity. In other words, love is a mark of true conversion. And the last we are going to look is we should love one another because God loves us. Because God loves us. So let, let us turn to, to our, our verse. That's chapter 4, verse uh, 7 to 11. We should love one another because God is the source of, of, of love. And, and I know when we are dealing with the subject of love, we must establish the foundation, isn't it? Defining terms. Uh, uh, John tells uh, this church in verse 7, 7a, the first part, he says this. Beloved, let us love one another another, for love is from God, right? And so we, we need to define what, what, what is talking about love here, right? Uh, because it's not just a mere emotion, you know, like uh, goosebumps, you know, uh, and you're like, yeah, I love this person. No, it's, it's, it's more than that. He's, he's referring to this selfless, unconditional, sacrificial love that is rooted in the character of God. This is the love that he's talking about. This is the love that we should love one another. And he also makes it clear that this love is not ours. This love has its source in God. And why, why do we struggle to love? Well, as, as I mentioned before, one of the reasons would be it's because we like people who are like us. Right? People who talk like us. Um, uh, 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 but we need to understand if that was the case none of us will have been saved, right? None of us will have been saved. So the call to love one another as a result that God is the source of love, I want also to touch that, brothers and sisters, this is not just a motivational moral Christianity, like, ah, just do better to love one another. 
No, 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 no. This is a gospel issue. This is a gospel issue. This is not just pull up your socks, try harder, you know, uh, you can do it, uh, just, just, just love, just love. No, this is a gospel issue. It's, it's, it's a gospel message that calls us to love one another with the transforming power of the gospel that only comes from God. And, and friends, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as, as your savior this morning, you have this love. You have this love. And, it, and it's not yours. And it's not yours. It only comes from God. And I, I can clearly tell that some of you know people who were so unloving when they've met Christ, they were transformed tragically. Like it's, it's a transformation that you could not even explain. Why? Because this love is a gift from God. It's God that gives dead people like you and me. And I want us to just sink in this reality. And I want to ask you, as you are here, have you met the source of love? Do you know him? Have you you met God in the person of Jesus Christ? Is he your savior? If, If the answer to that question is yes, we are called to love one another. And this does not mean you choose who to love, right? That troubled brother, that hard sister, we are called to love them because this love comes from God. Not only that, but we should also look to the second reason that we should love one another because love is a mark of genuine Christianity. Like, you want to know who is a Christian? Look for love, right? One of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to ask this this, this question this morning. Are you a Christian? Uh, Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? And and I know in our context, uh, this this question is is, is, is lost value, right? Um, Well, we we are a Christian nation. We We are in Zambia. We, we, we are a Christian nation. Um, uh, in, in, a, in, in a country where I grew up, people don't even ask anymore, are you a Christian? They, they use this term, are you a born again Christian? Right? Because it, it becomes like just a word in the air. We are a Christian nation, and therefore we are a Christian. That's what many people say. But that's, but that's not true. And many have come with many suggestions. How can you know if this person is a Christian? Some say, ah, Buana, you need to speak in tongues. You know, if you speak in tongues and you make the, those powerful prayers, and even their interpretation of what tongues is, is so unbiblical. Or oh, others would say, ah, oh, you need to be a, a Bible scholar. You know, like if you know your Greek, you know your Hebrew, you know, uh, uh, you know theology and things like that. Maybe in our context we'll say, well, because this person is preaching, he's a Christian. Or because this person serves in hospitality or music team or the kids and all those kind of things, that person is a Christian. As important as those things are, the apostle John in our text will disagree. Will disagree. He will disagree, but he will actually say, love is a mark of genuine Christianity. It's because when we love sacrificially, unconditionally, that we are displaying what God has done for us. And it's just no theory, right? The Apostle John said we should not only love in word. Now, but with all this said, how, how, how is it? Is John really telling us that love is a mark of genuine Christianity? Is, is that really in our text? Let us, let us read verse 7b so that we can together look to what the word of God says. And this is what he says. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God, right? Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Verse 8, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, let let us study together. Let's let's be good parents. Let's keep our eyes on on, on the text. Let's, Let's see what the Apostle John is building his argument as, 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 as why he's coming to say that love is a mark of genuine Christianity. Let's, let's study together. 
The first thing he says, whoever has been born of God and knows God, right? Whoever has been born of God knows God. And not only that, whoever love has been born of God and knows God. So that's, that is his claim, okay? His claim is that if you love, you are born of God and you know God. And then he says, anyone who does not love, what is the result or what is the conclusion? He does not know God. He, he is not born of God. And then he says, because God is love. You know, it's, it's very important for us to understand when we are talking about God being love, right? Because we live in an environment where love is, is, is all about just sweet, sweet, sweet things. But when we are talking about God is love, this is his holy love. This is who he is, right? God does not become love. God is love. And when talking about God, we are referring to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one, in perfect unity. He is love. God is love. This is who he is. This is character. And we are called to display this character if you have come to know him. And if it's not, this is not evident in your life, in my life, then you are not a Christian. Brothers and sisters, you, you, you can't miss it. You can't miss it. And not only that, John gives us another proof of this claim. Let us open the same uh, uh, a book and let's go to chapter 2, verse 9. See, let's see what he says about the same uh, um, subject of love. Verse, verse 9. Whoever says... He is in the light and hates his brother. He's still in the darkness. So, Buana, it's like saying, you can shout, like, I love that person. Like, I love that person, right? You can shout that, but practically, it's different. Or, you can, you can do all that you can do. Like, you, you even look very spiritual, you know. But once you hate your brother, you are still in the darkness. So, the Apostle John is clearly telling us that love is a mark of true conversion. Remember when our Lord Jesus Christ was about to be crucified, right? He, he, he tells his disciple, I'm leaving, but I give you a new commandment, right? And that commandment is to love one another. And Jesus says, it's through loving one another that the world will know that we are is. Right? Now, let me just make one point clear. Love is not the only mark of genuine Christianity. Okay? Mark, I mean, love is not the only mark of a true conversion. We should be clear of that. Because John says it um, chapter 3. Let's, let's all open our Bibles. Chapter 3. Verse 4 to 6. This is what it says. Everyone, um, John 3, First John chapter 3, verse 4 to 6. It says, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practice lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. As much as we are emphasizing today from our text that love is a mark of genuine Christianity, but the Apostle John is also saying that's not the only mark, right? We are called to live holy lives. We are called to forsake sin and pursue righteousness, right? So this is serious. We, like stealing, Sexual immorality, adultery, lying, and pride. This is serious. It's sin. It's sin. And, and I can clearly say that some, being someone who struggles some of these sins, this is an offense to the holiness of God. It is sin. 
right? But let us draw back. How many of, of us will doubt someone's salvation because he's been unloving? Right? Someone who struggles with these sins that we consider as big sins, we are quick to like doubt that person's salvation. And we are rightly so. But how many of us truly doubt salvation of an unloving Christian? Well, like, oh, it's okay. Um, he, he will get over it. Right? But friends, the Apostle John is telling us that love is a mark. And besides all these sins that we consider spectacular sins that we should, from the pulpit in our lives and daily deny them as much as that is evil, so is an unloving Christian. That is how serious this is. And from, from chapter 3 that you've just read, he also says, whoever does not practice righteousness, that's verse 10 of chapter 3, is not of God. Listen what it says. No is the one who does not love his brother. Okay? This is how, how serious it is. And, and one thing that I've seen, and, and even as churches, we tend to doubt, as I said, we tend to doubt when someone is struggling with the sins that we just mentioned before. But someone struggling to be an unloving Christian, we put it aside. But from what God's word today, we are being challenged. If that's you, if that's me, let us draw to God in repentance. And I know the reality of sin in my own life, and I know the reality of sin in your life, because of that, we will struggle to love one another. I know that. I know that. But the question is, how do we deal when we sin against each other? Do we forgive like God has forgiven us in Christ? Unconditionally? Sacrificially? The scripture tells us that love covers a multitude of sin. And it's because of love that we come along a struggling brother, a struggling sister, to encourage them. It's because of love that we practice church discipline. Right? It's because of love. Right? The love that we are talking about is not a love that entertains sin. Right? It's because of love that we practice church discipline, either correctively or formatively. But sadly, we tend to think when we don't confront others of, of their sins, we are being loving. That, sadly, that's what we think, right? You, you are seeing a brother who is like, brother, he's, he's struggling with sin. Like, you, you know it. You're like, ah, let me just uh, go back and say, ah, yeah, I don't, I don't want to hurt his feelings or her feelings, right? And we think that way we are being loving, right? But... <laughs> if that brother or sister is found out, we are the first one to say, ah, I knew it. Ah, I just knew it. Ah, I knew it. This, this sister, I've just been watching you from afar. Right? That is not loving. That is not loving. So I want to encourage all of us as a church. We have people in our midst, ourselves, we're struggling with sin. Right? It's a loving thing for you to do, to go and wrap his, your hand around your brother or your sister and say, sister, what you're doing is sinful. Come, let, let us honor our God. That is the most loving thing that you can do. And it's hard, isn't it? It's hard because we, 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 we are afraid to be put the holy than thou cap, right? But that's what we are called to do. As a as a, as a mark of our love towards God, right? We, we want to reflect the character of God. We want to reflect the holiness of God. And we do that as we come along a brother or a sister and point out their sin. And we do that lovingly. And so may we seek like meaningful relationships in the context of a local church where that 
is possible. And we are going to do that for the sake of love, but also for the sake of the gospel. Let us, let us love one another because love comes from God. Not only that, but it's a mark of your conversion. It's a mark of your conversion. And ultimately, your love for others will tell us if you know him, will tell us if you are born of him. So we have seen that we must love one another because uh, uh, love is a, love, uh, uh, God is a source of love. Or the second one, we have seen that love is a mark of genuine Christianity. But let us also go to the, to the last point. We are called to love one another because God loves us. Oh, all those two points, they are very crucial. Uh, when I, I, I could just land in this point, you know, like everything flows from this point because God loves us. So if, if you can go to your text, we are going to see verse 9 and 11. Um, it just is interesting in these verses that the Apostle John, he continues reminding uh, the believers that God is love and that God loves them, yet we should love one another. Why? Because God truly loves us. Have you ever just stopped and like, God loves me? Let's, let's, let's look what the verse says. Verse 9. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our, our sin. So we are seeing, the, the, the text is telling us, in this, the love of God was made manifest how or in what way? Well, by sending his son. So I want us to just think for a minute with this phrase, God sending his son. And what was the purpose, according to a text, that God sent his son? Well, so that we might live, so that sinners may live through him. So now, Stop for a minute. Uh, Apostle John is saying that God sent his son. Let's, let's go back to, to the beginning, right? This phrase that God sent his son, this is significant. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? And, 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 and created all things good. He created Adam and Eve, Right? And Adam has sinned, and the world fell into a curse. That's why when you are born, you are born a sinner. Um, my wife is expecting a child, and, and I know when I hold that baby one day, Lord willing, a sinner. Why? Because of sin. Adam has sinned. And not only that, in the curse, God promised a redeemer. God promised someone that is coming, a conqueror, someone that is coming. He promised that. And we, we, we see that sin has increased in the world, right? God in his goodness preserved Noah and his family. God in his goodness brings up Abraham and he makes a promise. Through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. God brings the nation of Israel, right? His covenantal people. He raises up Moses. Because of sin, the nation of Israel is in slavery in Egypt, right? God in his goodness raises up Moses, the deliverer. He comes and, and, and delivers the people of Israel. God miraculously delivers these people. And then goes, God shows Moses promised land. And he doesn't go into. God raises up Joshua, right? And God is faithful to his promise and the people are in the land. Joshua dies. And the nation back to sin. 
And God raises up judges. And, 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 and the Bible tells us that in the times of judges, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Can you, remember, can you imagine living in Zambia? Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Sin increased. God in his goodness tells us of the story of Ruth. Right? Naomi is in a foreign land. Husband dies. The son dies. She's left with two daughters-in-law. One decides to go, but Ruth says, where you go, I will go. Where you die, I will die. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. And God in his goodness brings Boaz into the story, and Ruth gets married to Boaz. And, and, they, and they, uh, Ruth conceives a son, Obed, right? And Obed Jesse, and Jesse, David. And when you go to the Old, I mean to the New Testament, the book of Matthew, in the genealogy of Christ, he tells us Christ, the son of David, Abraham. So when the Apostle John is saying that God sent his son, guess what? The Redeemer has come. The long-awaited Messiah, the long-awaited Satan conqueror has come. He sent him. It is great news for you and for me. So when he's saying that he sent his son, it's profound. It's, it's through this son that God is demonstrating his love for us. He, he truly loves us. The Apostle John is saying that God sending his son is an act of love. For what reason? So that we might live. God has been orchestrated all the history of the world to this point that the Messiah comes. He preserved the lineage of the Messiah and he has come so that through him we might live. This is a true statement or true demonstration of God's love for us. Verse 10 also say, in this is love. How? Not that we have loved God, but God loved us and sent his son. For what reason? Verse 10 tells us, he sent his son with a purpose to be the propitiation for our sins. To be the propitiation for our sins. So let's, let's look at verse 10a. He's saying God is the one who initiated this love. Right? God loves us. If you have come to know the Lord as your Savior, he loves you. None of us here can say, God I loved you first. None of us. If you are a Christian and you are able to say, God, I love you, it's because of the miracle of regeneration. If you can stand here and say, God, I love you, it's because of the miracle of regeneration. You were dead in your sins and trespasses. Right? But God made you alive. That's why we can shout and say, God, I love you. This is remarkable. God loved us first. And he loves us to the point of death. And not only that, let us look to Romans 5. If you can just turn your Bibles, let us turn to our Bibles. And we are going to see the reality of God's love for us. Romans 5. Romans 5, verse 6 to 8. This is what the word of God says. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one will dare even to die. But God shows, shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's God's demonstration of love for us. 
God did not die or love good people and godly people, sinful people. And if you are here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ and you, and you, and you think that your sin is too much, he died for you. Trust him and you will be saved. This is how much God loves us. He sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He he is the atoning sacrifice for our sin. Just like the people of Israel were in, 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 in slavery, right? We were enslaved of sin. And Christ came and brought us back to God. That is God's act of love for us. The atoning sacrifice that Christ Christ became on our behalf is a perfect example of true love. Because the love that we are talking about, it's a love that is sacrificial. The willingness to sacrifice your most valued possession for the good of your brother or sister. And in the case of God, guess what? It required his holy only son. The precious, innocent lamb of God who became the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Friends, this is the perfect demonstration of God's love. God loves us. You know, one of the things about God that is so amazing that is not like us We tend to say that we love people, right? But we hardly demonstrate. But God loves us and demonstrates it to the point of sending his son to be your substitute, my substitute. He made him who knew no sin to be sin so that through him, you and I can be right before God. Now, With all this reality of how much God has loved us, verse 11, um, the Apostle John comes to a conclusion of his argument from, from our message for today. He says, Beloved, if God so loved us, what are we ought to do? We are to love one another. With this reality, I want to humbly say that. Who are you to say to your fellow sinner who is saved by grace, I will not, in other words, I cannot love you. Some will even say, "Mm, mm, mm, I swear by my mother's grave, I can't. By my grandfather's grave, I can't and I will not love you. If that's your disposition, towards your fellow brother, you do not have a slight idea of how much God loves you. You do not know, and you do not know him. And and please, if you are overwhelmed, if you are overwhelmed by the offense of your brother, look to the cross. Look to the cross. If you are overwhelmed by the offense of your sister, just, just remind yourself, if you are a Christian, just remind yourself of the song that we've just sang. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. Look at this. That he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. That's how deep God Loves us. That's, that, that, that's, that's, that's deep. When we come to know the love of God for us, it completely transforms us. It completely transforms us. If you come to know the depth of the love of God, Do you know how much God loves you?
If you don't, look to the cross. If you do, remind yourself daily of the cross as you relate with people, with your fellow Christian. Remind yourself of God's love where he sacrificed his only son for sinful people like you and me. That's how much he loves you. And that's what the text is telling us. If, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If you're a Christian and you have not lived this truth out, I will kindly ask you to repent. Make this true in your relationship with other brothers and sisters in Christ. God loves you and he, he manifested his love. And this great love of God that sacri sacrificed his son on our behalf should burden us for the lost. Should, should burden us to those outside our community who do not know God. Or make it even more personal should burden me and should burden you for your children who do not know Christ. Should burden you, your mother who does not know Christ, your father who does not know Christ. Should burden us as we go to work. To tell calling sinners to come and drink from the fountain of life, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Calling them to come, come to Christ. And this same call is for you, my friend, if you do not know him. You have been coming in and out and you have been hearing, perhaps this message is not even new to you. I want to plead with you, come to the Savior. He loves you the point of death. So far we have seen that the Apostle John is, 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 is calling us to love one another because God is a source of love. The love that we have as Christian is from God. And also love is a mark of genuine Christianity and we have just seen that God loves us. Does your love for others point them to the God that created them and loved them? As, as you relate with your fellow brother, does your love for them point to what God has done? My fellow Christian brothers and sisters, let our conduct correctly represent God. And, and I know this is a great responsibility for us. Therefore, may we constantly seek help from the Holy Spirit in this endeavor that our brotherly love will truly manifest the love of God. Not only to ourselves, but also to the lost world. Therefore, we should be thankful to God for his amazing love. So as, as we conclude, we, we, we know that Kita Church exists to glorify God, right? By making gospel-centered, reproducing disciples of Jesus Christ. And it's, it, it is because of the love of God that we are saved and united to the body, the church. And, and, and love is essential for this great task of Great Commission living. Love is essential. And may our church be a river that flows with the love of God. May our church be a display of the love of God. True love is only found in God. And if you are a believer, this is not true of you. Sorry, if you are an unbeliever, this is not true of you. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the love that we are seeing from Scripture is not true of you. You perhaps do good works, 
right? You, you perhaps uh, take care of the poor. Continue doing that. But that's, that's, that's not a love, sacrificial love that comes from God. You need God. You need the Savior. And for us who are Christian and struggling to love one another, and perhaps you do not see even the significant, I, I just pray, I hope, that as we study God's word today, you are greatly challenged to see the importance of this. And please don't take it lightly. Um, I would like to challenge all of us here at Kuto Church. Be intentional with the, the brothers and sisters here in the community. Be intentional. Be a blessing to your local church. Do, do not be like the world who loves with selfish reasons. I pray, friends, as we look to God's word and see the reality of these truths, may we be moved to daily be reminded of the cross as we relate to one another. And let us love one another, friends, because God is a source of love, because love for one another is a mark of true Christianity. And most gloriously, God loves us. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Our loving God, thank you so much, Lord, for your word. I pray that you would help us see the significance of this truth. Pray for our friends who have joined us who do not know your son, that, Lord, the reality of your love will draw them to yourself. And help us as we relate one another here at Kitwe Church, that, God, we will be marked as a people who love sacrificially, unconditionally, Lord, reflecting your character. Lord, please help us to love also the lost, who most of the times we just pass by and go on with our own business. Lord, help us to do that. Thank you, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.